<laughs> I'm so sorry. That f uh, okay. Let's go live. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. So and now you have to introduce Masha with the rest okay. of us. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're live. Harrison, Jay, Mike, and we have Masha on the line. Masha, thank you so much for calling and bearing with us. Well, what is your question? Um, sure. Okay. So my question is about raising vitamin D levels. I had some blood work done last week and my vitamin D is sitting at 26. And that's actually the same exact value I had going into the summer. So, um, I wanted to raise that level naturally. I happen to be working outside all summer long, literally every day doing farm work, skin exposed, no sunscreen. I was smart though. Like I didn't get sunburned. I'd put on a long shirt if it had been a while. Um, but even after all that and living in California, you know, walking outside every day, my levels haven't budged. I've kind of stayed away from supplementing because I know a lot of the pro-metabolic community kind of looks down on that, but I'm wondering if maybe I should go that way. And if you guys think so, um, what version brand timing do you recommend with that? Thank you so much, Masha. And please give me all of your farming tips. I'd really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Gladly. Okay. okay. Thanks for Thank you me. so much, Masha. Okay. Take care. Can I start Danny? Yes. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> I, I just want to, I just want to say first that vitamin D is a poison. So <laughs> thank I'm you for serious, clarifying. Thank you for clarifying that. Like, I appreciate it. We don't want to, we don't want to use it. We don't want to be out in the sun. We want to completely <laughs> avoid it at all costs. Um, so actually I, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm sure. I hope everybody knows the sarcasm. Um, I would recommend in this case, I think supplementation could be helpful. Um, if you have a brand that doesn't irritate, your stomach or anything like that, you could do an oral vitamin D. Um, you could probably go between like two to 5,000 units. And um, I would take it in the morning, not at night, because your natural circadian rhythm for vitamin D would have it more towards the morning. And then I'd also, I wouldn't necessarily take vitamin D just by itself. I would also make sure to take it with, have all the other uh, A, K2, uh, calcium, magnesium, and ma make sure you have adequate zinc levels if you're going to take it. Um, cause they all kind of work together. Free for all Har Harrison thoughts, thoughts on um, vitamin D. Have you been yeah, be benefited in your life? I think it's pretty safe to, uh, supplement, um, like a good quality vitamin D, uh, for specific brands like, um, pure encapsulations or, um, the idea labs, um, play around with doing it topically and orally, um, perhaps choose one method and one dosage and stick with that um so you know if it's working for you or not and usually sometimes if people are supplementing with vitamin d and they're not getting their levels up um sometimes looking to a magnesium wow. supplement can help with that mr j yeah i i mean i agree i would definitely be considering cofactors magnesium calcium vitamin a uh k2. i think yeah k2 thanks mike yeah, that would be, I would consider those if your vitamin D levels are not going up in response to either vitamin D supplementation or sun exposure, I would look at those cofactors first. And then in addition to supplementing vitamin D in the way that you guys suggested, I'd also consider like a vitamin D lamp or a tanning bed if it's like a good quality UVB one. Uh, those would be two things I would look at either in place of the vitamin D, D supplementation if needed or in addition to, I guess, potentially, but you really wouldn't probably need both. But Masha wasn't supplementing and the level wasn't going up. She right. was just out in the sun and the I level know. was going up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. but still, I mean, same same thing. I look at the cofactors and then maybe it either wasn't enough sun exposure or now with the winter, it's not enough. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and uh, yeah, if anybody cares, the, the dannyrowdy.substack.com, I wrote an article on vitamin D. But I, I think supplementing it is safe, hard stop that. All those things are important, the vitamin K, the other things, but I, I don't think it's like uh, if you vit if you supplement with vitamin D, it's dangerous if you don't do X, Y, and Z. I think it's just safe in general. But obviously a person wants to fortify their nutrition with everything, you know, and that's why liver, oysters, and eggs are so critical. Okay, so let's uh, – let me shut up here and we'll take the next call. Okay. Thanks, Masha. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay, caller, you are on the air, and what is your name and where are you calling from? Hi there. Uh, this is Ely. I'm calling from Philadelphia. Ellie, how are you, sir? <laughs> well, what was your oh, question, wonderful. buddy? Wonderful. <laughs> so I just heard the, the caller before me talking about vitamin D. Uh, from personal experience, um, 
the oral is what worked for me. Uh, when I did topical, despite me using large dosages, it never budged. I stayed at 20. Uh, with I need, I need high oral dosages, 10,000 or so to keep a decent level of vitamin D. Thanks for mentioning that. I've heard that from multiple people. In fact, somebody had uh, like raging digestive problems and we were talking and and because, because I'm a big fan of topical. And so this person used a topical supplement, but it never increased their level. And then they got a vitamin D and olive oil and started taking it orally. And not only did it solve the digestive, the IBS like symptoms they had, but, uh, but again, they, they found that it was very effective orally, but not so much topically. And so I led that person astray in that one. But but that, I'm, I actually have vitamin D on my leg right now, so I still use it. Anyways, Ellie, what, what, what was your question? Uh, I have two questions, if I could. Uh, the first one is related uh, to twitching. Uh, lately, I've been having a lot of twitching all wow. over. It mostly happens at nighttime. And I can't seem to figure out why, what's causing it. Um, the only thing that seems to help is mitigating EMF as much as possible. Now, um, progesterone and uh, tuberoptidine, nothing like that helped. But uh, yeah, what helped a little bit is mitig- EMF mitigation. And uh, I never thought like I would have that type of thing. Uh, but it is real. And uh, it's waking me up in the middle of the night a lot of times. And it's there during the day. Um, I do take thyroid, uh, GI function is so much better than it was before. So everything seems to be going well, except that really annoying switching. Uh, that's question one. Uh, question two is uh, a real easy one. A TSH, I'm getting different levels depending on the time that I test it during the day. If I test it first thing in the morning, it's good. It's closer to 0.5. But if I test it, uh, I mean, if I test it later, but when I test it in the morning, it's three. I'm getting three consistently in the morning, and I'm getting closer to 0.5 uh, during the middle of the day. So anything you can speak to that would be greatly appreciated. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much for calling. And I do love you all, and I appreciate <laughs> what you're doing. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon, brother. Thank you very Bye. much. <laughs> Bye. Okay, twitching and then the TSH changing during the course of the day. Mike, go for it. Uh. On the twitching, in my experience, it, there, that could be related to electrolytes or it could be related to eating something irritating you, uh, at least in my experience, with what I've worked with clients and for myself. For me specifically, when I was having a lot of muscle twitching, I was eating something that wasn't agreeing with me and I was, it was giving me like a lot of twitching inside in my legs. Uh, as far as EMF related concerns, I mean, it's definitely a possibility. The EMF does open, I think calcium channels would, which in muscles would cause contraction. So it's possible that you could be responding to EMF, but I'd also maybe put your diet in the chronometer and try and see if it correlates with something that you're eating. And then you can also take a look and see where your sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium levels, et cetera, are make sure you're getting adequate amounts. So it could be, it could be a combination of those three factors. With the EMF, though, I mean, the the you could take things to protect against the EMF, but while you're in EMF, the field is going to open those calcium channels. So the best thing to do is really avoid it. Um, as far as the TSH goes, there for the different hormones, like if you even if you look at cortisol, like an AM versus PM cortisol, you have a circadian rhythm for those differing hormones, that where they're higher at some points and lower at other points. And so it's not only across the day, it could be across the month and then it could be across seasons where you can see like elevations in the pituitary hormones during winter um, and like l- lowering of thyroid function during the winter or increasing of gonadal hormones during the spring, things like that. So uh, it's I don't know directly and I don't want to lead you astray offhand of um, the specifics of the curve from the during the day for TSH. But I wouldn't be surprised that TSH would peak in the morning because cortisol also tends to peak in the morning. Um, so it, I would probably look, if it was me personally, I would probably look to shoot for a lower morning TSH number and kind of use that as a guidance because I think that's if I, I think that that is the point where the pituitary hormones do peak is towards the morning. And then Harrison, if you have any, anything to add in, then Jay. I would just echo the the electrolytes for the for the muscle twitching. Um, 
trying to get as much salt in as you can and see how you feel with that. I know I feel better. Um, I handle EMF better when my magnesium is high or I'm doing things to keep my magnesium high, like Epsom salt baths. Um, and yeah, the TSH, I don't really have much to, to say on that. As far as the, uh, the electrolytes go, I agree. I would also emphasize getting enough potassium, then magnesium, calcium, and of course, sodium, as Harrison said. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note that it's happening at night for him. And so obviously night is a time when we tend to be under stress more. And <clears throat> especially if it's happening at a certain point where maybe someone's running low on glycogen or there's some other factor, because I see the twitching basically is just a sign of stress, right? And the electrolytes help to relax the cells, uh, but there can be other factors driving it. In this case, maybe EMFs is a factor, or maybe you're susceptible to the depletion of energy and resulting calcium channel opening from the EMFs due to already being in a lower energy state or being under some stress that could be due to gut irritation, as Mike said, or maybe low glycogen or, you know, again, lack of electrolytes or various other factors. So I would do just the general things to help mitigate stress that I think could also help with the twitching. Uh, as far as the TSH, I would also just wonder about whether taking the thyroid is affecting the value. So if you're taking the thyroid, you know, after you would have gotten that first test, but then the afternoon test, it's much lower. I wonder if that could be affecting in such a short period of time. Okay. Great stuff. I agree with all of that. Um, okay, guys, accepting calls, please call in. We'll be hanging out here for about an hour. We have Mr. Harrison Ben. We have Mike Fave. We have Jay Feldman, our expert roundtable panel. <laughs> Just joking. Oh, what? For the this, um, this gives muscle twitch. Sorry. For the muscle twitching and the vitamin, vitamin D, I've noticed that I've had muscle twitching when I've taken high amounts of vitamin D and then adding in the other fat soluble vitamins along with the electrolytes has helped that. Looks uh, like you got a call, Danny. Yeah, let's do this. Okay. Um, okay, caller, you are on the air. Uh, what is your name? What, what is your name? Where are you calling from? And then what is your question? Hello? Yeah, you're, you're on the air. What is your name? Where are you calling from? And what is your question? Hey, uh, this is Javier calling from California. Hey, Javier. So I, hey, I wanted to ask about broad results for prolactin, cortisol, ACTH. Similar question to the one before, but just wanted to get everyone's opinion on the validity and accuracy of these results. Now, I'll give you some context. So I spent a month using anti-prolactin substances like metergoline or Lyseride, and they are shown to lower prolactin in all the studies. But my blood results actually increased by 12 points from doing the, the test and using the substances. And my stress hormones also increased. Cortisol, for example, ACTH. My serotonin actually went down. So if serotonin is a major promoter of prolactin and ACTH, how do you explain my high ACTH and prolactin? Thank you. The blood test can be so confusing. Sorry. Th thanks for that, Javier. Appreciate you calling in. Uh, okay, I think Javier's gone. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, caller, call in right now. <laughs> call in after we talk. We answer this. Okay, Mike Fave, what do you what do you think? Uh, I would first of all, I would question the potency of the products that you're using. I don't know where you got them from. Um, Just to be clear, they're so they, idea labs still. Okay. So, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to speak to idea labs specifically. Um, I haven't ever tried those specific products for, uh, for lowering prolactin or ACTH or cortisol. And that's also not the first route I would go to lower those stress hormones. Uh, I would, I would generally address other factors first like diet, lifestyle, and more basic supplements before I started using uh, pharmaceuticals like that. The second thing I want to mention is serotonin is a driver of prolactin increases, but so is estrogen. So I'd want to be interested to see where your estrogen, where your androgens are, and uh, where thyroid function is as well. And yeah, I would I would hit the foundations first before I even played with those those drugs because there are when you start to mess with a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs that target very specific receptors, you get you can have very weird side effects and rebounding effects in the long run. I don't have anything specific to say about Ideal Labs, but um, I would be very careful with those, particularly dopamine agonists. There's dopamine withdrawals can be like dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome is or Dawes is an actual thing. I'd be really hesitant to jump right into using those compounds and getting into that pharmaceutical approach. 
and it looks like it's not working for you. So my recommendation would be to go back to the basics and address what could be caught, what can be causing elevations in your, um, prolactin. Maybe if your serotonin was low, it, maybe if it was just, if you're looking at serum, perhaps I don't know other measures that are good for serotonin. It's not some, not a measure that I generally look at, but I would recommend going back and seeing if there's something that you're eating or doing on a regular basis that's causing issues or causing a hormonal imbalance for you and, and look into those foundational factors that we've continued to talk about. Harrison and then Jay. Um, I would agree with what Mike had to say. Um, I, I forget what the timeline was. It was like four weeks or something. And then I don't know if you're like combining or stacking these, these products together. I'm not sure what your dosage is if you're taking them topically or orally. Um, and if you're like all over the place with the dosage and you're trying one for two weeks and then trying another for two weeks and, or combining them, I think, um, if you're going to take the pharmaceutical products, I would one, make sure that you've really, really got the, what Mike said, like the, the foundation dialed down. And I think I would need a little bit more information for how much he's taking and, and why the purpose of taking each one or combining them and, and I think I need more information for that. Yeah. And there's Jay. Jay is the last cool. one. <laughs> <laughs> so waiting for you to announce me, Danny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Obviously, what's what this person's doing at the moment is not working. Uh, I would agree a lot with, with what you guys said. I would also emphasize maybe that the dosage might be too low to see the sort of to see the sort of impact that you'd be looking for if you really had elevated prolactin, uh, you know, obviously in the bioenergetic space, when we're using some, or when people use some of these different products, they tend to use them in a lower dose than would be used pharmaceutically. And so perhaps it's just not a high enough dose to see that. But I would also say that doesn't mean you should necessarily use a high enough dose to see that. I would rather address the foundations of why these are off in the first place. And I wouldn't just look to reducing the prolactin directly with a prolactin lowering compound uh, I would look to the foundations of what's going on. And I do think prolactin is a good measure of excess estrogen in the body, like systemically better than estrogen levels in the blood. And so I think that can give you a lot of indication and clues as far as kind of a route to go down and, and things to address. Uh, I don't know and too much about the validity of serum serotonin. So oh. the fact that that went up or down may or may not actually matter, may or may not reflect tissue serotonin levels or brain serotonin levels or anything beyond that. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any have any better uh, like idea of of that of the validity of serum serotonin okay. and then cortisol and ACTH. Again, if you're looking at the exact same time of day and you're seeing them elevated compared to before, I think it's just more of a sign that what you're doing is not working. And so, uh, look toward other avenues. So I have a question: What do you guys do if you're if you're engage if you have a symptom and you're engaging in uh, experiments to try to overcome the symptom? What what do you, do you have a fallback to uh, some kind of, if what you're doing is not working, what do you do? That's my, that's my question. So we'll start with Mike. Like your, um, your personal strategy. Well, but just before that, I do want to jump in really quick and about the serum serotonin thing. And then I, <laughs> is that okay, Danny? And I'll, and I'll answer your, <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, as far as I don't think that serum serotonin was an ideal marker for measuring serotonin because uh, there's multiple hypotheses about serotonin, but essentially the serotonin can be adjusted based on gut irritation and things like that with the gut being the major pr cr pr uh, creator of serotonin in the body. And then in the literature, and I guess there is there is some debate about this, but there's this idea, there's like conflicting theories because you have like the, the like serotonin fatigue hypothesis, hypothesis where central serotonin causes fatigue, but then you also have this idea in literature where serotonin in the brain is a good thing and it improves your mood. So there's like for serotonin overall, I don't think at least from what I've read so far that it's a great indicator overall of what's going on. Um, like the serum serotonin level uh, as, and I, from what I understand, I think a lot of serotonin is actually in interacted or bound with platelets. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of that as a marker. That's why I didn't really have much to say about it. Um, now, as far as if I have a symptom or I'm experiencing something that is, you know, like out of the ordinary, I always go back to my foundation. And for me, I've 
what I've done for myself is I built out a system that works for me. So I have a general paradigm that I run every single day or do every single day. And, um, if I have a deviation then I go back to that and I look at what I added in newer adjusted. I know we have a call, Danny. Yeah, no, it's okay. I, I want to, I like this question. I like my own question that I asked you guys. <laughs> yeah, Harrison and Jay. <laughs> More than this next caller. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> well, may, okay. Maybe you're right. Maybe we'll, uh, okay. We'll ask, uh, answer this one. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Caller, you are on the air. Uh, where, what is your name? Where are you calling from? And what is your question? Sure. My name is Tom. I'm calling from Oklahoma, and I have a question about chemical sensitivity and vasculitis. Right. I have a situation where this doesn't matter whether I'm at work or at somebody's house. They've got air fresheners diffusing the public restroom. Chemicals, in particular, but also cleaning chemicals like floor cleaners tend to be one of the worst, seem to incite a pretty significant case of vasculitis. Um, now that's something that's subject to change over the course of the month. It's also subject to change based on my level of stress. In a weird way, the more stressed I am, the less symptoms I seem to have. I don't know if there's a cortisol component to this or not, but I wanted to see since chemicals, especially, you know, for those of us, Danny, that don't live in Mexico that are still in the States, Everybody's got these air fresheners all over the place in their cars and everywhere else. So I can't it's avoid worse it. Mexico. Yeah, it's, it's the taxis in Mexico <laughs> are the worst. The worst. <laughs> was, well, go, go ahead, want, Tom. Can you describe your vasculitis? Like, what exactly do you mean by vasculitis? Sure. So it's fairly systemic, but it seems to be mainly concentrated in the arms and head. So, of course, brain fog is going to be one of the major symptoms in the head. But I've noticed over the course of years, as these flare-ups have accrued, that I've developed visible damage. Nothing like a, a spider or a varicose vein, but there's areas in my veins, especially visible in the arms, where there's a, almost a bubbling or, you know, an area that's been weakened. And as a result, you can see unevenness to the vein. Um, no leaky capillaries or anything like that where, you know, you think there's something going on with the, the smaller vasculature. It seems to just be restricted to the vein. As far as I know, the arteries aren't affected. I've got a, a appointment with a vascular doctor, finally after years of dealing with this, uh, throwing in the towel and seeing if they can do anything for me in the medical world, but I figured you guys might know something. So when you have, when you're exposed to these chemicals, you essentially, you the unevenness or the spots in your veins become more visible. Is that the symptom besides the brain fog? Yeah, good question. So they don't become more visible, but those spots are the ones that hurt. So the symptomology kind of starts with the exposure, of course, and then you have, or I have, pain in the veins. Uh, it used to be just in my hands, like a kind of Raynaud situation. And then over time, the forearms are included. And that's when I started to notice the damage to the veins in my forearms. It's gotten to the point now where the bicep veins, um, you know, inside bicep area and even some of the shoulders are affected. And I can tell, you know, it's not just a, a muscular thing or, or some kind of random, um, random pain. It is actually the veins because the sites of pain correlate to the sites where over time, you know, I have this accrual of what I can only think of as damage. Okay. Oh, that okay, that well, gives a good picture. We'll get into it. Thank you so much for calling, Tom. Thank you. Okay, bye, brother. I'm kind of up the creek on this one. What is, that, is that a nitric oxide type of thing from the chemical sensitivity? It, it sounds like his, uh, like his vasculature is react like, it sounds like his vasculature is reactive, like pretty easily to any type of insult. I mean, if you're smelling something, you ha you have that's if you're smelling fumes, they're getting most likely getting down into your lungs, and then you have an exchange, but with the gases and contents or components at the lungs, which will reach the vasculature. So it sounds like he gets a, like it sounds like a like a like like initially like he said were nods, but it sounds like his his uh, vessels are responding to that insult or like they're like in a hyper reactive state. I actually had a patient 
yesterday in the hospital who had, I'm not saying that this is what Tom has, but she has a, she's a dialysis patient. She has extensive vascular problems and her vasculature is like hyper reactive and it has extremely weird patterns. So both of her, both of the veins in her arms are completely shot from having to put dialysis catheters in. And so we're having to take the blood pressure on her legs, but she, it seems like she gets some types of like vasospasms or whatnot, because sometimes her blood pressure in her legs will be 190 over 120. And then 20 minutes later, the blood pressure will be 60 over 30. So like we couldn't get consistent, um, readings on her because of just how bad her vasculature is. And I'm using that as a kind of a corollary because in Tom's situation, and again, this isn't medical advice or anything. It's just like random opinion from, a, from me, but it, um, it sounds like he is your vas his vasculature is like quite reactive to insults. And then the synthetic chemicals and the fumes and whatnot are triggering like a, either a nitric oxide response or like, maybe like triggering endothelin one, which is in that whole cascade overall. Um, so yeah, that, that's what it sounds like. That's what I would guess would be going on. And then the things to do would be vascular protective substances, which can include, you know, the general ones would be like a vitamin E and an aspirin. But then there's also like the differing plant compounds, like some of the ones in pomegranate juice, some of the ones in orange juice and the differing fruits and whatnot. Here's energy. <laughs> um, for general chemical sensitivity, I find that um, anti antihistamine substances like ciproheptadine, Benadryl, um, work for like even uh, building up your defenses to not be as perturbed by the the chemical sensitivity, um, and then looking to um, remove any foods that might be causing any sort of digestive stress or disorders or perhaps um, foods that can uh, help the, the digestive system like the carrot salad or char charcoal or bamboo shoots or something like that. And for nitric oxide, I find, um, say if you're like really perturbed by like um, a chemical sensitivity exposure event, I find caffeine, aspirin, and sugar to be um, a really good remedy for that. I remember I kind of like poisoned myself working smelling like this car engine that I was working on and I was going to pass out. And, um, I just remembered that it's probably had to do with nitric oxide. So I took a, a lot of caffeine, a lot of aspirin, and then I shined red light on myself in that instance. And it rebounded me pretty quickly. And Jay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I've worked with multiple people with chemical sensitivity issues or like EMF sensitivity issues. And I think that they're pretty parallel, you know, and some people who have really, really intense food sensitivities too. I think I wouldn't focus so much on the symptom itself of the vasculitis. Like I would do some things to help mitigate that symptom while also considering the fact that this is a sign of systemic over or hyper reactivity, meaning kind of like the earlier question about EMFs, like very easily entering into that stress state, the cells not being very relaxed in that high energy state and instead being very likely to contract. And so that's where I would focus more on like the people who I've worked with who have had really great improvements from those sorts of really like hyper reactive states. It's not because of doing something necessarily specific to the symptom or unique to the symptom, but rather focusing on, on the big picture there. And he mentioned that uh, it seems like it's not as bad when he's more stressed and has more cortisol or adrenaline which I think supports that. And it made me think of uh, the Wim Hof method, which like the way that the Wim Hof method works to like mitigate inflammation is by causing like extreme hypoxic stress. And so they did that study looking at how he's able to withstand endotoxin. injections of endotoxin or whatever it was from, you know, without them making him intensely sick. And it's because he like the Wim Hof breathing drives hypoxia, causes a lot of stress, creates a lot of adrenaline and cortisol production, which has that short-term anti-inflammatory effect, uh, activates the backup energy produ production processes, but comes at a major cost long-term. But it does just support the magnitude of an effect that this, that, so like that increasing energy production can have and reducing stress can have. And uh, yeah, just the fact that Tom was noticing that I think points to this being 
a systemic energetic st- and or stress issue uh, beyond anything else. Well said. Um, okay, let's get back to my question. Back to my <laughs> question. One. So, Arizona, if you have a problem, how do you, and what you're doing is not working, how would you go about uh, trying to figure it out? Um, generally speaking, I find it's, it's more helpful to try to identify what I can remove um, that might be causing the problem than look to add first. I think that could be, um, that's something that I've learned over the years. Um, and then I just wanted to mention one more thing with the caller about the lyceride and the metagoline. Those oh, yeah. are both dopaminergic substances, which can raise adrenaline quite a bit. So that could be the reason why you have the, the cortisol and the ACTH off the charts. And then Jay, last, last you. Yeah. I like what Harrison said, where, what I always look at first is what changed. So it's, so as he mentioned, it's not a matter of adding something new in, but rather considering if I was doing really well, like what happened to make me feel worse. And that can be a bit of a witch hunt. Like, I guess it depends on the scenario. I know for me, I felt very different traveling in different places. And there's so many variables that change from food to the house itself and like potentially mold exposure to altitude on from there, you know, just the travels themselves, EMFs and and on. So sometimes it can be tricky, but I think it, for most people, it, you know, there's not such variability. Uh, but yeah, I'm always considering what change and trying to kind of revert back. I think this was what Mike said too, like revert back to the foundation that works and then try to sort, like try to learn about the problem more so I can figure out uh, what might've happened and how to address it. Well said. Okay, here, let's take this caller. Um, Uh, caller, you are on the air. <laughs> what is your name and where are you calling from? Oh, hey, uh, I'm, uh, this is Dalton from, uh, Analyze and Optimize. You see yeah. what's going on, guys? Yes, Dalton, how what's are you? What's going on, man? <laughs> what's up, Dalton? Um, so I got, I got a quick question for you. Um, so I've been dealing with some lingering, uh, like stomach, mainly, uh, digestive issues. And, um, so I had a stool confirmed, uh, like yeast overgrowth. So I've been on a, a pretty hefty cycle of a uh, fluconazole, which is a uh, antifungal. And uh, it's been like, whatever. Oh, did we just lose him. <laughs> he just left. Yeah. Does Dalton him. left? Oh, Dalton. Has he tried the flowers of sulfur? Oh, maybe he's uh, uh, Is this him again? I, I don't know if this is his number. Uh, well, I guess we'll just find out. It was a 201 number. I think it's Oh, yeah, that's, that's him. Uh, D- is this Dalton? Well, I guess we'll just find out. It was a- it, it, Dalton? Hello? Yo, okay, you're back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I looks like we got disconnected there. Um, so what I was saying was, uh, yeah, so I've been on the uh, antifungals and I haven't really uh, experienced much of a benefit. But what I have noticed is that when I take like pretty large doses of cyproheptidine, like four milligrams, uh, my digestion is like pretty much back to normal. Oh my god, I'm, guys! I'm not doing. It. I'm not kicking them off. Okay. Stop kicking them off. <laughs> I don't know, Dalton, I don't know what's going on, brother. Um, but feel free to call back. We'll just keep keep doing this. Dalton, are you paying your AT and T bill, or what's going on here? <laughs> this is pretty annoying. <laughs> keep keep going. We can do this all day. Um. So what I was saying was, yeah. The cyproheptidine does help. So I was thinking about uh, going on some penicillin DK. So what I was going to ask was what dosages and for how long uh, would you recommend uh, for some chronic issues? Like it really started with uh, after I did this extended fast, uh, which obviously in hindsight was a horrible idea. Well, I just left. Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. Oh, he's back. <laughs> he's, so, back he's so fast, though. No, okay, no. you did an ex- you did an extended fast, and then and then I started having these problems. So, but the question is, how long uh, and what dosages and how frequently would you be taking penicillin DK uh, to alleviate these issues? Thanks. Okay, thanks, bro- brother. I appreciate it. I could start. Um, I use penicillin VK a lot. So, if you have a bacterial problem, if it's not like a fungal thing. I thought 100 uh, milligrams to 250, three to four times per day for two or three weeks usually worked really well. And then I'd just make sure to take vitamin K at the same time. And the last thing I'll say is this was a Ray strategy. He said he thought it worked well if a person kind of sucked on the tablet and didn't swallow it. And I think that's actually 
think he's probably right about that because one time, this is like 2017, I was taking them every four hours and I woke up in the morning, took the dose, but like left it on my cheek and, and went back to sleep. And when I woke back up, it had really created intense irritation, like really close to my cheek. And so I think that's why Ray was saying you want to like dilute it as you're sucking on it to slowly have it absorb. And I think, th again, if, if it can be really useful if, if it was a bacterial infection, but I, it, we'd probably need more information if he's taking an antifungal. But, but. Wait, he said it was, it was fungal? He or, thought it was fungal initially, used antifungals, didn't have much benefit. Then he started using cyproheptidine, which really helped. So now he's thinking it might be bacterial instead of or in addition to fungal. So he wants to try penicillin. One last thing. I have papers, uh, like there's something, I have a paper that talks about a small intestinal fungal overgrowth, a SIFO. And they basically say the symptoms are almost identical to a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So I think it's a lot of the time trial and error. But Mike, what do you think? Um, if you already have a known fungal problem, I don't know if I would go ahead and throw antibiotics on top of that because it can actually make, possibly make things worse. The other thing that was interesting to me specifically is that he said that he developed the issues after a fast. So what I may what I would say perhaps is that the it may the problem may not directly be the fungal or the bacterial overgrowth situation directly. Perhaps you had you know maybe there's some types of deficiency going on with different vitamins which can affect um, digestive function pretty specifically, particularly some of the B vitamins. And then the other thing is just some with a lot of the digestive stuff, uh, taking out the problematic foods and having foods that that you know work for you for a period of time or that are easily digested, and then building your strength back up, you find over time that you'll be able to tolerate foods. My recommendations for antimicrobials, I actually would stay away from, um, particularly in this in the fungal situation, I would stay away from using an antibiotic because um, if you have a known fungal situation going on, and I would also not recommend fluconazole off the bat. That is a pretty potent drug as far as some of the effects in the liver. And I think it can it inhibit some of the cholesterol pathways in humans as well. And I, th I think the way it, it works is by inhibiting some of the CYP enzymes in, in, um, in fungus that allows them to produce, I think, their ergosterol inside their cells. So the drug is fluconazole and and I think that it also may have some anti-androgenic functions as well. So I would avoid those medications and as much as possible. And there's some studies showing that just having like regular coconut oil can lower uh, fungal, particularly candida overgrowth in the gut. Um, in mice, I think it decreased it by like like 40 or 50 percent. And then getting your intestines to function appropriately if you develop some type of deficiency as well as like moving to foods that you tolerate well would be my course of action. And as far as antimicrobials go, I would actually prefer personally, and you guys may disagree, but I prefer personally to use herbal stuff first. So I do like trialing oregano oil. The reason why I like oregano oil or even like Ceylon cinnamon is because they both have pretty potent antimicrobial effects that's both antifungal and antibacterial. And then a lot of the studies show, or there's some studies that show that the effects on some of the other bacteria that aren't as pathogenic um, isn't like it's more like bacterial static or microbial static rather than uh, cytal. So it's not necessarily a killing effect. Um, so whereas the antibiotics for some people, especially if you're using high doses, even uh, can cause um, further issues. So I would try diet first and maybe some supplementation. And then I would um, move over to trying like a oregano oil or a Ceylon cinnamon. Harrison in the J. Um, I think, yeah, Danny, I agree with what you said for the penicillin BK. Um, I think it's, if you are going to try it, um, you take enough to notice a, an improvement and then maybe back off. Um, the, I would look like Mike said, I would look probably to identify other things that could probably be like antifungal, antibacterial that kind of solve that can work to mitigate both. Like um, some of the saturated fats, um, prior to swinging the bat for the antifungal and swinging the bat the other way for the antibacterial, I would look to try some midline things that could potentially help with both the uh, coconut oil, um, the oregano oil. And I would also perhaps try the flowers of sulfur, like a pinch of that. It's, I've had really good results with that for, um, 
like fungal fungal stuff uh, pretty quickly. And uh, yeah, Jay Feldman. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I I agree that I wouldn't necessarily jump on the antibiotic route. If I were to, I tended to have better results with tetracycline as opposed to penicillin. So that's another one to consider. Also, low dose, as little as like. 25 to 75 milligrams twice a day is was generally effective for me. I would kind of titrate up and just take the powder out of the capsules and measure it on a scale. So that's something I would consider, of course, not medical advice. But yeah, I don't necessarily think that there's a reason to think that it's necessarily bacterial. So you had a test that showed fungal. Uh, I think sometimes the test can be questionable. But the fact that the fluconazole didn't work I think it's a good sign that your symptoms are not caused by the fungal issue. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily caused by a bacterial issue just because the cyproheptidine worked, which is just a general, among other things, you know, it's going to help lower histamine and serotonin. So it, you could have digestive symptoms because of something you're eating that's irritating, because of a poor digestion, low stomach acid, low bile production, or not well concentrated bile or slow motility, or it could also be a bacterial issue. So and then as I think Mike and Harrison were kind of saying, if it was a bacterial issue, I'd probably try some of those herbals first, maybe like a monolaurin. You guys mentioned fatty acids. So that would be like a stronger uh, form. And then something like oregano oil to pair it with it. Or Mike, I know you also said Ceylon cinnamon, which are both great. And the good thing about those is whether it's fungal or uh, a parasite or bacterial, it should still be relatively effective. So I'd probably start there if there's no reason to think that there's like a digestive deficiency and if your diet's really clean and you've tested all the foods out and you don't think there's anything irritating you, uh, that would be some of the things I would do. I would also, I, I like using activated charcoal as a diagnostic here. Again, it's not, it can be relatively nonspecific, kind of like cyproheptidine. So it might not give you too much more information, but uh, it might be something else to consider. Anti-fungal uh, foods also, I would, or antifungal, antibacterial that can work both ways, manuka, honey, and um, garlic. Can yeah, also ginger, 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 or horseradish are also pretty good antimicrobial foods, and the carrot salad, of course. And I wanted to say also, I really liked that he. I mean, I don't like that this happened, but the fact that this happened after a fast is something I want to highlight because fasting is so often suggested to remedy these issues, especially fasting from glucose and carbohydrate when it comes to fungal issues, and. Yet a decrease in metabolism and lower body temperature is the best way to cause or allow for a fungal infection to take hold. And so a fast is a good way to do that. So, yeah, I think it's just worth emphasizing again that fasting is not a very effective solution for a microbial issue. It's not a long – go ahead, Danny. Sorry. No, you go. I was going to say it's not a long-term solution. I think it – like for people, they may get symptomatic relief because there's nothing right. in the gut to ferment. But I've seen that too. A lot of people come out of like fasting and carnivore and like while they were in those paradigms, they had to decrease foods more and more and more and more and more. And they felt better with like more limitations. And then by the end of it, like I've had some people where it's like, all I can eat is meat and that's it. And everything else that I eat will irritate me. And I personally, I've been in that, that camp at one point. I didn't get all the way to meat per se, but, uh, but constantly eliminating, eliminating, eliminating. And it, I wound up just like being able to eat nothing. Whereas when I like when I bolstered my nutrition and then I also over time with having adequate nutrition, eating foods that I knew, you know, at that point weren't bothering me, I would add new things in and eventually I would develop a more of a tolerance to them. And now I have a much more expanded diet than I did. And it continues to to grow as I find different things that I like and that work. Um, and the same thing with clients. They've come to me with digestive issues. And when we start out, they're like, oh, I have this juice. I'm not tolerating it. it doesn't do well. I'm getting this. I'm getting that. And then with some consistency and introducing it appropriately, like one at a time and at a, you know, not just slamming a half gallon to start, uh, people wind up tolerating more stuff and then over time they feel better. And I do think a lot of digestive stuff, a lot of people's digestive issues can come from energetic issues and from nutrient deficiencies because the gut is extremely nutrient intensive, um, and gut and especially and including the liver. And then it's also, um, requires a lot of nutrition to, to function to function appropriately what about diarrhea and gas being more indicative of a fungal or bacterial overgrowth and then constipation while not mutually exclusive being more indicative of just generalized low thyroid mike 
or anybody. Yeah, that. I because I, 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 we didn't really go over. I didn't, did he mention what his bells were like? I don't, he didn't, right? No, he didn't mention what the uh, symptoms were. I think, I think he mentioned like stomach. Because this stuff can, I, I can be too much of a black box. It's like, okay, I'm using like uh, an antibacterial, what, like why, for what symptom? Because my stomach is like, I'm not digesting well. And so yeah. I, I feel like if a person was having chronic diarrhea, most of the time that would necessitate some kind of intervention. Um, but I'm curious what you guys think. I would just I'm, say, I, I think chronic constipation can also be caused by microbes, but I think in both like whether it's diarrhea or constipation based, I think thyroid and metabolism is going to have a huge, huge role. I think that most people get digestive issues. Like I didn't get more severe digestive issues until after I went the low carb, um, fasting, intermittent fasting and heavy exercise route. And when I came through that, it was basically like, I couldn't eat anything. Like there was things before, like, and I would think to myself, like, man, when I was, when I was a kid or when I was a teenager or like even right before I did the low carb stuff, like I was eating stuff with no problems. And then when I finished, I had to like work my way back, uh, to where I was before. As far as the constipation stuff specifically, I've seen people, um, get constipation from particular foods. Like if they eat a lot of grains like wheat or if they're eating a lot of soy or some people, if they're eating, some people don't respond well to cow dairy that can give them some constipation. And then the recommendation would be to avoid those foods or the dairy switch over to like a uh, goat or a sheep dairy or something like that. Or they have a two dairy now in the store. Um, and I've seen people respond better to that. And then I've also seen people go on super low fat diets and the super low fat diets I've seen cause constipation for some people because it doesn't trigger the bile release and the cholecystokinin release in the intestine. And then they, that kind of slows the bowels down. And for diarrhea, something to consider is also like bile acid diarrhea. So if you go on like some people I've had be on high fat diets and they're having like 40 or 50 grams of fat per meal and then they're getting diarrhea and like GI distress and it was like bile dumping essentially. They just didn't tolerate it. So I just lowered their fat intake um, or I changed the types of fats that they were eating because that alters the bile composition. And then that will, that can eliminate some of the diarrhea. So it's, it, there can be multiple causes. Um, and I, I would really recommend that, that people exhaust all options before hopping on something like fluconazole or hopping into heavy antibiotics, because there are side effects from, from doing those things. Um, when I've taken full doses of, like I've taken full doses of antibiotics, like, so you guys are recommending not full, full courses, but I've taken full courses and I've hurt myself. Like I've taken a full course of tetracycline, things like that. And I've gotten actually bad, worse off than when I did it before. So that can be hit and miss sometimes. So I'd be careful. Like a dysbiosis after taking the tetracycline? Yeah. So I took tetracycline, um, like a full course, like, like full recommended doses the, for the full amount of time. And then afterwards I had like worsening digestive issues um, and like, coated tongue and all types of stuff. So I would not recommend <laughs> going the full boat. Like just, what I did. Just out of curious, curiosity, were you taking vitamin K? Cause I've experienced the same thing, but I've never experienced that with vitamin K before. Um, I may or may, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember specifically, but I have tried, I've played around with a bunch of different antibiotics and I, uh, I've, some of them I've felt I've had good responses from, and some of them I've had poor responses from, and I also, something to keep in mind is again, like I took a full course. So I wasn't taking like 25 or 50 milligrams of tetracycline. I was taking like 250 or I think 500 milligram dosages, which is like a lot higher. So and it, I, when I took it, I had gotten like frank diarrhea from it within like four days. I was like, just run into the bathroom. Yeah. I, so. a, a 500 milligram tablet of penicillin will instantaneously irritate my intestine. So it's. Yeah, I think the low dose, and then I've had that dysbiosis after taking like minocycline, and I it would extend for a while, and then I would take a huge dose of vitamin K and it'd go away in like a day. So I yeah, I don't know what was going on there, but yeah, okay, we have I have about uh, I don't know five ten minutes, and we didn't get to any of the questions that people sent in. Did did you have any more to say, Harrison or Jay? Um, for just talking about I just like realized constipation. I, I moved Sorry. on. I moved on, but. Do we cover that satisfactorily? 
<laughs> okay. Well, I, guess, I think we each had some yeah, stuff. Okay, okay. Go for it. <laughs> we'll move on. Okay. Um, okay. Guys, call in. Last few callers here. Uh, 708 on my end. And if we don't get one, I will just play. How about I just do that in? Okay. Let me well, just... Danny, I think... I think Harrison had something oh, to add. Oh, go ahead. I want to ask a few things to add too for that last question. Oh, you know what? We got a call. <laughs> All right. Harrison, <laughs> hold that thought. Okay, this is like the last call here. Okay, yeah. Okay, caller, you are on the air. Uh, what is your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm calling from uh, Amsterdam. <laughs> oh wow, that's a long ways away. <laughs> uh, it is. <laughs> Thank you for calling, sir. Well, what is your question? Um, well, my question, uh, since you guys were talking about, uh, uh, gut issues, um, uh, I'm actually working as a doctor and I, 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 um, I'm coming into contact, uh, a, a lot lately with people having, uh, stomach issues. So GERD, probably like uh, gastrointestinal reflux. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, what your guys uh, take on that and how you would tackle that problem. That's my question. Thank you so much for calling. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Talk All to you right. Bye. <laughs> yep. Yeah, bye. Uh, okay. Well, I have a lot of experience with GERD. Yeah. Um, okay. Go for it. Personally, with clients, um, I guess I'll just mention a couple of helpful things. Like the sleeping position is extremely important. Um, the hormones you can't outrule. Like I caused myself to have GERD by taking very, very high doses of progesterone, and I was able to reliably um, cause the cause the GERD to come about every time I would introduce the progesterone, whether it was topically or orally. So there's definitely a hormonal thing um, that you could consider with some of the, the people having GERD. Um, I know Danny's mentioned in the past, um, like a dysbiosis also causing GERD. Um, and you can also treat sometimes a hormonal issue by attacking it from like a, like a, a gut, a gut view point. Um, like things that have worked as, as band-aids, um, like ciproheptanine has been very effective. Famotidine has been really good. So I would look to famotidine and ciproheptanine, baking soda and a carrot salad. If someone is like really, really, um, my good at one point was so bad when I was taking the really high amounts of progesterone that I would be afraid to fall asleep at night because I, I, I know GERD would happen. Um, and usually around the same time every night, like three and 4 AM, which could be a, a cortisol related thing. But like the antidote for me before bed is if I, if I stayed away from fatty, from really fatty foods, um, and instead had like a carrot salad with some like famotidine, then I know I would be able to like sleep through the night without issues and then address the, the other underlying hormonal factors. For me, it was removing high dose progesterone. Um, and I would say as well that it is mitigated by, um, EMF as well. Um, so that's a lot in a nutshell. Jay. Yeah. So I have a lot of experience with clients with GERD and, uh, like some really severe, interestingly Harrison, I've also seen in very rare cases, but someone like like women who are using progesterone, even just with their cycles, and they'll have GERD in response to it. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting point. But so I think there's a few things to consider here. One is basically what is causing the reflux. And so when you're considering like the LES, the lower es esophageal uh, sphincter, esophageal, yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of factors that allow it to like stay tight and closed so that the stomach acid isn't coming up. One is adequate calcium. So that's something I would, uh, consider. Another is actually like strong enough stomach acid. So low stomach acid can sometimes cause GERD and reflux through that mechanism. And so doing things to support stomach acid production can really help. Uh, I know Mike and I have discussed this before, and this is something I've taken from Mike, which is using glycine and taurine together with meals. Uh, I've seen quite a few clients have a lot of benefits with that because both glycine and taurine help to increase stomach acid production and uh, also have other benefits intestinally and, and stomach wise. Uh, so that would be a couple of things I would consider. Another is zinc carnosine. I've seen that have some benefits in people with. I found, uh, that, to, sorry, I found that to be very effective. Zinc carnosine, um, 
and was stocked with baking soda to be very effective. There's actually a drug in Japan, like clinically yeah. approved in carnosine. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, Sorry, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, and also, you know, considering herbs or foods that help to stimulate stomach acid production as well, uh, some of which, you know, could be irritating if someone has really bad GERD. But again, coming back to like ginger, horseradish, anything that can be rather bitter, uh, lemon or, or acid or acidic foods, vinegar can all uh, be beneficial as well. And then, of course, considering other potential causes of reflux or GERD, or GERD which can inco- uh, involve microbial issues too. So I would be considering that side of the equation as well. And thyroid and general metabolism as always, but there are like direct correlations there too. Yeah, I've experienced that many times and it's either the dose of thyroid is too low or the, uh, the, the antibiotic would take care of it within like a day or two. Um, so but that's most of my... I, that's most of my experience with it. Okay, we'll take. We can take one last caller here, or um, or we can play one. Uh, oh. We also didn't uh, get Mike's answers. Oh, I'm question. so Mike. I'm so sorry, brother. <laughs> I think I was so I was so <laughs> used okay. to doing Mike Harrison and Jay. I was like, oh, I Mike already went. <laughs> Mike, go. Um, I have a couple things about GERD specifically. Um, so, the as far as hormones go. Excess glucocorticoids or even taking glucocorticoid drugs have been known to directly cause stomach ulcers. So when they put somebody in the hospital, on st- and I'm pretty sure our caller was a doctor, so he may know this already, but when you put somebody in the, in the hospital on steroids, the, they, we automatically put them on protonics, which I, not, I don't recommend that drug at all. But they put people on protonics, and the protonics um, is used to pr- lower stomach acid, protect against ulcers. So if people are under stress, Developing ulcers under stress is a known, uh, a known thing, and and so like you, if you develop a stomach ulcer, you will you can have symptoms of GERD. You can have that irritation. Uh, the second piece, and I have a series of pieces here. The second piece is that in high fat meals, it the fat inside the stomach delays gastric emptying, and so that delayed gastric emptying, like what Harrison was describing, if you eat a high fat meal before bed. And then you go lay down, you can increase your risk for GERD because you slow the gastric emptying, you increase that the production of stomach acid. Um, uh, And that's through fat triggers the release of cholecystokinin inside the stomach uh, or inside the small intestine, excuse me. And the cholecystokinin triggers the uh, I think it alters gastric emptying and then it also triggers the release of digestive enzymes. So fat is a trick and also bile acid. So fat is a trigger for that. Um, Certain other foods, too, like wheat contains uh, glucagon-like peptide 1 uh, agonists. And so there's drugs that are actually like that now. And those agonists can also do- heavily delay gastric emptying. So certain foods can trigger that. Um, the next thing is dysbiosis, which you guys kind of touched on. But certain bacteria release different compounds. I think hydrogen sulfide is one of them that can cause a relaxing of the lower esophageal sphinc- sphincter and increase the GERD. Um, and then... Another thing, the H. pylori is obviously a big one. Uh, the doctors in the U.S. at least use triple therapy often, which is a combination of three antibiotics. And I've seen that wreck people's guts afterwards. Uh, it's not penicillin. It's like erythromycin, flagell, and I think something else. Right, moxi- that, moxicillin, uh, usually. Amoxicillin. And amoxicillin. So I'd be very hesitant about using that combination, um, especially I think – I know Ray has like posted a study where like olive oil eliminated H. pylori. And then um, there's a bunch of other herbal compounds that can do it as well. Uh, The other one I wanted to mention was the migrating motor complex in the intestine is a system that takes about three hours to to under to basically move the food through the intestine. Um, And every time you eat, that system restarts. So if you're at risk or you have digestive issues, just leaving like eating your meal and then leaving maybe three hours between and then having the next meal can help for a period of time to maybe lower dysbiosis or stop for some bloating. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention here was as far as medications for, um, for GERD or for ulcers, I, their main two main ones are Pepsid, um, which is famotidine. And then the other one is Protonix, which is Pantoprazole. Pantoprazole is a pretty terrible drug. Um, it's extremely difficult to get off because you have a, a rebound hyperacidity once you stop taking it that lasts for an extended period of time. 
uh, whereas famotidine doesn't have that. And then I think Georgie posted some studies at one point on the forum uh, describing the use of protonics and an increased risk of things like Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. Um, it, it's not really a great jug overall. It's something that I would highly avoid. So if you have ulcers or you have GERD, Jay mentioned taurine and glycine, which I use all the time. Another thing I use a lot with people is collagen hydrolysate because the stomach lining is dependent upon adequate collagen production and also mucus and the 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 collagen or gelatin can help to rebuild that in combination with vitamin C. Although I wouldn't recommend ascorbic acid, I recommend to get it from fruits or uh, juice or camu camu or something like that. And then zinc carnosine is something I've used with people with like extreme success. And also um, uh, like a calcium bicarbonate. Two two more things that I do want to mention: uh, bismuth, salicylate, the active yeah. ingredient, and Pepto Bismol. Mm -hmm. I was able to find that. Um, outside of Pepto-Bismol, but in like a herb blend. So that could be useful. Um, and one thing that has purported to be very useful, but with some side effects that you may not like is the cabbage juice. I have never felt so cold after <laughs> drinking some cabbage juice because of the uh, anti-thyroid effects. Like it helped with the stomach, but I was, uh, I was super frigid. So it definitely does inhibit the thyroid. Okay, doke. Let's uh, wrap it up because I actually have a call pretty soon. Um, okay, so Mike, okay. where where can we find more of your work on the internet? So you guys can find me at mikefavenp.com, and then you can also find me on Jay's and I, uh, Jay's and I's podcast, the Energy Balance Podcast on YouTube, and then I guess I'll announce it here. But Hans and I are no longer doing podcast, guys. Um, so uh, I, you won't be seeing me on his channel anymore. I'll be here and with Jay and then um, on my own website. And then Jay, it was the same question to you, buddy. Uh, yeah, my website's jfeldmanwellness.com. And then as Mike mentioned, the Energy Balance Podcast, which is on YouTube, but also anywhere you listen to podcasts. I did want to mention this super quick uh, in regard to the GERD question, which is B vitamins. Some, I saw somebody mention that in the comments, but I've seen that help immensely for quite a few people. So I wanted to make sure I threw that in there. Great stuff in here in Harrison. <laughs> um, you can find me here or you can message me on Instagram. Awesome. I think you post it in the YouTube link. <laughs> awesome guys. Uh, we have an amazing viewership, a viewership, a uh, very small, but very engaged. Thank you guys so much. And tomorrow we're generative energy. We'll be back with Georgie Dinkov tomorrow at 8 PM CST, 6 PM uh, PST and 9 PM uh, EST. So guys, thank you. The third episode feels like a lot more. So really appreciate you guys hanging out with me and uh, answering all these questions. And we'll be back in about two weeks, depending on when we can schedule it. And so again, Harrison, Mike, Jay, thank you guys so much. And we'll be back at it about two weeks from now. Okay. Thanks everybody. Peace out. See you guys soon. Bye.